Um, thank you, Derek, very much. And, and thank you, Nina, and to all of you who put on Shy Hack Night because it's an incredibly important part of the tech community um, here in Chicago. For those of you who uh, don't know, um, probably 15 years ago, uh, you could have fit the number of you who would show up at a hack night into a closet here uh, at, at Braintree. And, uh, and in fact, Braintree didn't exist. Um, and, uh, and, and much of the Chicago tech community was really in a nascent stage. So uh, that's only just to give you a history of where you sit at this moment. In other words, where we sit as a tech community at this moment is historic. It really has never happened in any other city that it's grown quite this fast and this well. And I hope you all feel that energy across the city. Um, it's energy that I want to take across the state of Illinois. Um, we have so much to do in this state to solve the many problems that we face going forward. And it's going to take you, frankly, uh, and innovation and energy to solve those problems. This, these are not easy problems. You all have read in the newspaper the political challenges. But beyond the political challenges, there are financial challenges. And there are challenges about truly transforming the way we operate our government uh, and making sure that we're serving people as best we can across the state of Illinois. Um, so let me step back and just introduce myself for a minute. Uh, and say to you, um, I've been married for 24 years to an obviously incredibly tolerant woman. Um, and uh, I've got two kids, a 14-year-old daughter. Um, those of you who either have a 14-year-old daughter, have had a 14-year-old daughter, or have been a 14-year-old daughter, maybe you could send me a manual. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm learning as I go. Um, and uh, she is a state-ranked cross-country runner. Um, really proud of that fact. She obviously gets her athletic ability from me. Um, and, uh, and a son who's 12 years old, who's kind of a, a budding computer scientist and, uh, and a football fanatic and a math whiz. Um, and uh, contrary to maybe what some people may know or think, uh, of me, I grew up in a small business household. My parents bought a motel and built a motel business, starting from one motel and you know creating an environment for it uh, that people wanted to come to, and then a, another motel they acquired and built a chain. And that was the environment I grew up in as a kid. Uh, for those of you who have parents who were in a small business, um, you know, you were all in, I, no doubt, right? I mean, your parents talked about it as my parents did at breakfast, at dinner. You know, you, you were working there before it was legal to work there. Um, and, uh, and that's how it was for me. Um, but, uh, but the very first job that I ever had was actually working at the motel at age 14. I was lucky enough to, you know, that my parents allowed me to do that. And... Uh, frankly, they decided they wanted to give me like what they thought was the hardest job at the motel. Um, and that job, they thought the hardest job was pick up the dirty sheets from the motel buildings um, and take them to the industrial uh, laundry facility that they had created on the campus of the motel, load them into the uh, washing machine, and then move them over to the dryer. That was pretty much my first summer job. Um, it was actually a, a, a good job, though, though a hard job. But the most memorable thing about that first job, 14 years old, maybe some of you remember going off to work the very first day. Um, you're nervous. I was nervous. And, you know, I had my bus money to get to the uh, motel. And um, I had, um, you know, I was just worried that I wasn't going to live up to what my obligations. You know, I'd never had a boss, a real boss, other than my parents before. Um, so there I was nervous trying to head off to work. And my mother stopped me and she put her hands on my shoulders, and she said to me, now remember, you have to work twice as hard as the guy next to you because you didn't earn this job, and he did. And there are a lot of people in the world who get said that to, to, to them by their parents or by somebody else um, because they have to work twice as hard to keep the job or to get the job in the first place. I knew, you know, my mother was telling me something different. It was, you're pretty lucky. You have good parents, and you have the ability to pay for college when you go and the, to pursue the things you want to pursue in your life. And so, you know, you better know that. And so I wake up every day thinking about, I've got to work hard to earn everything that I've been given. 
Um, and so I try to do that. I didn't follow my, my parents into their business. Um, and instead, the lesson I took, uh, maybe like all of you, and, you know, what your parents say means a lot less than what your parents actually do. And um, so watching them, what looked like a lot of fun to me was just creating a business. And so that's what I went and did. Um, and today, you know, we do a lot of different things in our business, but um, one of the things we do is um, we're investors in the technology world. Uh, another thing that we do is we make, I'm looking around to see if we uh, make anything that's sitting around. We make coffee sleeves. So when you go to Starbucks or other places and put a coffee sleeve on, yay. Um, <laughs> And yes, thank you. We actually made that coffee sleeve right there. Um, thank you. And I did not pay him to come here and show that off. Um, um, but uh, so next time you go to Starbucks or other places and you um, order a coffee and get a coffee sleeve, ask for two because tell them you have extra sensitive fingers. Um, and by the way, they work really great on cold drinks too. We're trying this out. You know, maybe you'll fall for it. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, they're, they're environmentally friendly, uh, fiber-based products uh, that we make, so like sandwich boxes when you go take out sandwich uh, place, that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, but it's been the, you know, the work that I've done in the technology world, and it's where I started uh, in business really, uh, was in technology that, that, that I've been proudest of across the, you know, the city uh, in terms of you know, my business. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to pursue things like building 1871, um, you know, when there was no place really for people to build a business to work together unless you happened to be a student on campus at Northwestern or at University of Chicago uh, or at UIC. If you were just an entrepreneur who had a really good idea and knew your market and were able to develop a product, you were doing that in a Starbucks or in your own apartment and you know nobody's help uh, there with you and not able to find maybe the engineering talent that you might need to add to your team uh, or another entrepreneur to just help out. And so that was really the idea behind 1871 was that collaboration produces success. And so that's how it came about. Um, like a lot of things, and I'll tell you a few other things that I've been involved in, but like a lot of things that are big and important that get created, they don't get created by one person. You know, you provide some leadership and you provide vision and you grab people and bring them into the room, uh, maybe nonprofit leaders and business leaders and community leaders and everyday Illinoisans who care deeply about the issue that you're trying to solve. Um, and, and then you work it out, you figure out what the plan ought to be, and then you all pull on the oar together once you've got that plan. And that's how we created 1871. So I've been proud to be sort of named the founder of it, but there were an awful lot of people that I could point to across the city of Chicago that participated in it way before it ever opened its doors. And we didn't know if it would be successful. And people said, by the way, oh, Chicago, there's no chance you're gonna have that many startups that you're gonna be able to you know, fill up a place like 1871. Well, you, you all have proved them wrong, and all the people at 1871, and frankly, the amazing growth in the entrepreneurial community here has proven them wrong, which I think you should all be proud of. Uh, but there are a lot of other things. I think, you know, my parents, both my parents passed away, my mother uh, when I was 17, my father when I was seven. Um, but, you know, they, they imbued some values uh, in me that have never left me, my brother, my sister. Um, and there are values about social justice and economic justice. There are also values of my faith. And those are things that I carry with me every day um, and things that I think about. And so when I think about, you know, what would they be proud of? What would be the things that I can do in my life that they really would say, you know, I'm proud and good job. Um, they're the things that have truly impacted tens of thousands of people's lives across the state of Illinois. There are 230,000 kids across Illinois today who get school breakfast in low-income school districts because of the work that I did with the Greater Chicago Food Depository and Share Our Strength to take an Obama-inspired uh, program called No Kid Hungry at the federal level and, a, and expand it across the state of Illinois into those school districts. These are kids, by the way, that otherwise wouldn't eat breakfast and maybe aren't eating dinner. They get a school lunch, but we helped them get a school breakfast, and you know that if you have to go through half of your school day hungry, you're probably not gonna learn very well. So it's a great program, and we were able to expand it across the state of Illinois. Um, there are 
more than 50,000 kids who go to the Illinois Holocaust Museum every year to learn to fight bigotry and hatred and intolerance. Kids here in Illinois. And we, I, I led the effort to build the Illinois Holocaust Museum with the survivors, um, with the business community, with elected leaders. Uh, but we built that. And there are thousands of teachers that go to the Illinois Holocaust Museum every year to learn and take those lessons back to their classrooms all across the state of Illinois so that we can expand you know, the impact uh, of learning to fight bigotry and hatred and intolerance. And then 60,000 adults every year or more uh, that visit that museum. For more than 20 years, I've led uh, an effort to expand early childhood education and quality preschool, quality child care um, across the United States. A quarter of kids who show up at kindergarten in the United States and here in Illinois are not ready to learn when they show up at kindergarten, and many of them never catch up. And most of those kids are low-income kids from black and brown communities, and no one has really stood up for them. And early childhood education and childcare are incredibly important in brain development um, and helping parents be better parents. So in that period of zero to five, before you show up at kindergarten, 85% of brain development takes place. And yet, you know, as a society, we haven't really invested in uh, those kids and helping them succeed. Uh, in those earliest years. So that's something that I've worked on for 20 years, more than 20 years. And here in Illinois, thousands of kids are in quality preschool and quality childcare because of the work that I've done. Again, I name all these things in my background. You're probably wondering, like, gee, that's great, your bio, you know, those are all things you did in the past. What are you going to do for me as governor? But I tell you all those things because it's really important, I think, to understand. I could line up all the candidates who are thinking about running for governor or who are running for governor today on the Democratic side. And fundamentally, we agree on many issues. I'm for a progressive income tax. I think that I ought to pay a higher rate of tax than someone who makes $40,000 or $30,000 a year. We need a progressive income tax. And so we need to raise the minimum wage in this state to $15. Um, and that's not even a, you know, it used to be called a living wage. It's really not. But we should raise it. It's $8.25 today in Illinois. We should raise it to $15. We should, yeah, thank you. Uh, we should legalize marijuana in this state. And, and, and not for, yeah. I saw who clapped first, yeah. Um, um, uh, uh, yeah, all of you who agree, clap. How about that? Uh, all right, just don't make them feel bad. So. Um, uh, but, but there are really good reasons uh, that are beyond just, you know, let's tax it, we need the tax revenue. Um, in fact, I would say that's the third of three reasons uh, that we should legalize marijuana. One is safety. You know, I have a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old, and to my knowledge, they're not currently smoking pot. <laughs> um, uh, somebody, can somebody go check that? Um, and, uh, and, and I'm not, my wife's not, but, but, it, but if you get pot, you don't know where it came from mostly, and you don't know what's in it. And there are a lot of people who get it, um, in, you know, and obviously they're getting it illegally, um, but from people who want to get them into other drugs and sometimes lace them with things. We should just legalize it. It's the right thing to do. And as my daughter, when I asked her, 14-year-old, when I asked her about, you know, can you get, you know, do kids in school, are they able to get it at 14 and so on, she said yes. Um, and then she pointed into our living room and said, Dad, you know, there's a whole bunch of bottles of alcohol that are sitting there that you have for parties. And people die from that, but, but nobody's ever died from smoking marijuana. So... Um, uh, you know, from the mouth of a 14-year-old. Um, so uh, criminal justice reform is the, is the second reason. The first is safety. Second is criminal justice reform. That's, you know, kind of a plain, I don't need to go into that, but, um, but it's pretty clear. Um, and then the third, of course, is there are 350 to $650 million of tax revenue uh, that we could bring into this state and certainly revenue that we badly need. Um, there are a lot of issues. My point was that if you lined up all the candidates, not every candidate agrees about marijuana, but, but we all agree on you know, progressive income tax and, and, and raising the minimum wage and, and, and a, a series of other issues, which we, I hope we'll get a chance to talk about tonight. But the question you have to ask yourself is, every politician, every person running for office stands up and tells you what you want to hear. And, and yet 
not everybody has the capability to actually get those things done. And so I think the question that you should ask about the candidates is what have they done? What were they doing, in fact, when they weren't running for public office to make people's lives better? What, what impact did they have when they weren't serving or what, you know, when they were just being themselves and in their own careers? What were they doing before they decided to run? Um, and those are things, I mean, I'm proud of the things that I've gotten accomplished. They're big things. Um, they're things that affected, have affected maybe more than 100,000 people in the state of Illinois, but tens of thousands of people certainly. And, and, and I believe today that, you know, bringing people together to solve problems, big problems, is certainly what we need in Springfield. If anybody watched the catastrophe um, that was uh, the you know, entire budget debate over the last number of months and frankly over the last two years, I think we would all say that this state lacks leadership. Uh, certainly this governor um, who you know, took off his Rolex and put it in a drawer and put on a Timex watch and decided to put a plaid shirt on and then he put a Carhartt jacket on, dropped his G's um, and ran and got elected and then all of a sudden he pulled out from underneath his jacket the hidden agenda. And the hidden agenda, which he held the state hostage to for more than two years, um, is a Koch Brothers inspired right wing agenda. And I, that sounds like hyperbole, it's not. In every state around us in the Midwest, they've succeeded at getting right to work legislation passed and therefore destroying unions. Um, at, at bringing down wages, at fighting against workplace safety to make it cheaper for businesses to operate in those states. Um, and, and they've won, I mean, they have won with Republican governors, Scott Walker and so on, if you, every state around us. If you look at the map of 2016 and the election in 2016, it's, there's a blue Illinois and red all the way around our state, all the way around. And to us, to me anyway, that looks like an island that we have to protect. To the Koch brothers and to, you know, to those who support the Koch brothers and their network, um, that looks like a bullseye. The blue spot in the middle looks like a bullseye and they already have a governor who is part of their network fighting for this agenda and we have to defeat him. 2018, you may have heard this in 2016, 2014 and prior, but in 2018, truly in Illinois, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. I'm older than a lot of people in the room most important election of my lifetime. I thought 2016 was the most important election of my lifetime, by the way, it, and it may have been in, in retrospect. Um, uh, but now here we are heading toward 2018 and then we'll careen quickly toward 2020. Uh, but in 2018, if we do not win, uh, we will probably be a right to work state. Uh, we will probably have lower wages in this state. Uh, we will probably have a destroyed safety net in this state. And even if you are not touching the safety net today, and even if you are not friends with somebody who's touching the safety net and fallen into the safety net in this state, someone in your community is. And it's there for you because anything can happen. Because 08, 09 and the Great Recession could happen again. And we saw that people who had perfectly solid, good, you know, um, uh, employment and homes and families um, were destroyed by 0809 and needed help from our government. If it happens again, Illinois has ripped that apart because of Bruce Rauner. Uh, so we need a governor who's going to remake and rebuild um, and put the state back on track and have a safety net that protects people. And fundamentally what I believe is we have to fight for our safety net, we have to fight for people who are trying to achieve getting to the middle class, and then we got to fight for the middle class. I mean, those are the big things that, that we've got to do in the state. It means creating jobs and raising wages. It means standing up for health care and against Trump care, um, which will destroy health care in the state and the finances of our state. Um, and we've got to maybe, maybe the most important thing for the future of our state, we've got to rebuild the education system in Illinois. We're 50th. In the, state of Illinois, in the United States, we're 50th. The state of Illinois is 50th in state funding for education, 50th. We provide, the state government provides 26% of K-12 education funding. The rest of it is property taxes. 
26% comes from the state. The average state in the United States, 46%. So even if we double, we're just about average. We've got a lot of work to do on education funding. And then universities have been decimated. 60% cuts in university funding. I mean, it's unsustainable. Um, and so we've got, you know, we all know that we've got great private universities. We have great public universities uh, in this state. They've always been great. But every year under Bruce Rauner, we're losing faculty, we're losing students, uh, we're, programs are closing. Uh, we can't sustain it. And we're a great state and we're best known many, of the re reasons that people move to Illinois and move their businesses to Illinois and build their businesses in Illinois um, and create jobs and, and, and raise their families here. Many of the reasons are we have really well-educated and dedicated people here. And if people are gonna get up and leave, and they are, um, and if our education system is gonna be deteriorating and destroyed, um, this will not be the phenomenal state that I think we all want and it will be frankly, a shadow of its former self and a Koch Brothers subsidiary. Um, so I, I'm going to stop there and I want to answer questions. I know um, all of you, uh, you know, this is a really smart crowd, so I'm going to try hard to, uh, to, 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 to uh, keep up to the level that you guys are at, but really appreciate the opportunity to come speak with you. Um, so a uh, quick mo note, um, we'll, we'll let uh, uh, JB pick the, the questions uh, the askers. I just want to make a note about questions. Please make them questions and not comments. Uh, also try to keep them short uh, and only one question per person. So you can't like stack three up in a row. So with that, uh, house rules, uh, please, JB. House rules. Um, gosh, gentlemen right here. Oh, and let me wait to ask the question so I can give you the mic. Thanks for being here. Um, my question is kind of about how you're getting over an uh, urban-rural divide, a real one or perceived one in the state. I'm from Bloomington Normal, Illinois, right in the middle. So I'm pretty familiar with you know, how some people think of you, how some people think of the state and what's going on. And I just want your take on that. And how are you reaching out to people in the rest of the state? Good. Um, so uh, let's start with the, the divide. Um, there, unfortunately, and I just want to, you know, I'm going to pin this on our governor because he really has done this. He's created a war between Chicago and the rest of the state. There are people across Illinois who think that Chicago, that we're, you know, that everybody here is scheming, essentially, to take things away from the rest of the state. Is that fair? True. Yeah, people believe that. And yet, that's not true. The problems, the challenges that we face in Chicago, frankly, are the very same challenges that you hear in Bloomington Normal, and you hear in Peoria, and you hear in Carbondale, and Cairo, and so on um, across the state. What are they? I mean, those, those last things that I just said to you. Um, it is about jobs and education and health care. I mean, those are the things you hear about. And violence, by the way. We think we're the only ones with a problem um, it's not true. You know, go to Peoria and talk to people who live in the black community in Peoria. Um, go to Carbondale and ask people if they have a violence problem. They do. Um, and so, so these challenges are very common, actually, but people have been led to believe that, you know, our community here in Chicago is against their community, wherever they may be, Bloomington Normal or elsewhere. Um, so I want to debunk that. And frankly, I won't be a governor who's for one part of the state or another part of the state, because it isn't about that. We have so much to do across the state of Illinois. I mean, I live here in Chicago, um, but I, I have traveled all over the state uh, as a candidate. I've only been a candidate for 90 days, but I've spent a good portion of that, frankly, outside of Cook County, um, because it is so important for people to get hope back. Um, and when you go to coal country, I'll just give you the example of, you know, people who've lost their jobs because, you know, there's a di diminution of the use of coal. Coal uh, mining and, and the labor unions that represented them are gone. Um, and we do still produce coal in the state, but it's being shipped to China. Um, and it's a, at a much lower rate. So, um, so there are real challenges. People are not only out of work, but I mean destitute. Um, and we see that here in Cook County, too. Um, not about coal, but about other things where people are truly 
destitute. So I just want to debunk the whole idea. I'm doing my best to try to be a candidate and then a governor for all of Illinois. Um, and again, that means about focusing on the primary issues that are, I think, important for the future, particularly the next four years. We have to have someone who's going to stand up for a balanced budget, which, you know, this governor didn't do, stand up for education, make sure that we're paying for K-12 education, and the governor's got to sign this, you know, new school funding formula because we think we have a budget, but actually schools may not get funded if he vetoes the school funding formula that he's got on his desk right now. So real challenge. And that affects, and that, you know, the one thing I want to say, and I'm very much in favor of the school funding formula change, which I won't go through the details of, but just to say to you that it really does make one major improvement in the way that we fund schools. And that is it flips the, you know, the story it now funds as at, at a tier one uh, basis uh, the kids who've been left out of the school funding formula in the past. I mean, the poorest kids in the state are actually going to be the first ones to get funded under that formula, and that's something I think that's a really good change. Chicago will also get $300 million, which is badly needed, and this governor has vetoed any money for Chicago, I think, again, because of that war that he wants to have between Chicago and the rest of the state. I um, just want to call on... Yes, right here, and then I'll come back to you. Clean elections, I heard you say, you're, you're I, here in Cook County, right? That's uh, where you work. Yes, in Cook Great. County, yeah. and um, Good. We're, uh, we're, I'm also an environmentalist, and so my question is going to be, um, you know, thinking about the Paris Climate Accords, and we're kind of the laughing stock of the world right now with President Trump. Uh, what would you do to bring Illinois to a 100% clean energy status? And what would you do to bring those valuable renewable energy jobs to our state? Good. Um, so first, first the start of that, <clears throat> there are two starts I want to make to that. One is uh, we should essentially, here in Illinois, live up to the Paris Climate Treaty. I mean, we, there are, yeah. <clears throat> that... That, tr that treaty, as you know, doesn't get us to 100% clean energy. Um, it just, but it gets us, you know, on the path, uh, which is a really good thing. 100% clean energy, as you know, is a, an attainable goal, but one that takes real effort over a sustained period of time. Um, and, and I'll be a governor that will continue the effort while living up to that Paris Climate Treaty, um, continue the effort to, to move that direction. You guys all know in the tech world that, that, um, the big challenge with, uh, with as we move to renewable to clean energy um, is essentially battery technology is the biggest challenge that we have. Um, there are a lot of others, but, but that's the biggest one. And <clears throat> I'm happy to say that we have one of the great states in the country for battery technology research. Um, and so that's something that we ought to be going to the federal government. We do have, you know, at Argonne, for example, we get a lot of federal dollars. Um, that help with the development of battery technology. But, um, but unfortunately, we have a governor, and this is, you know, true fact, everybody. Um, uh, this governor hasn't lobbied for anything in Washington. Um, and that's just wrong. I mean, we ought to have a governor who's standing, who's trying to get as many resources as we can get for the state of Illinois. But in particular, research is going to be a hugely important um, component of solving the clean energy uh, challenge that we have, and that requires us to get more funding for research here in Illinois, where we really are developing. Le you know, last little comment I'd make is um, just about Donald Trump, because I didn't get a chance to say this, and I'm really proud of this fact. There's no candidate running for governor today that fought harder against Donald Trump last year in the last election cycle than I did. I, I traveled to multiple states knocking on doors, phone banking, raising money, giving money, and I was on national television calling him what he is, which is a racist and a xenophobe. And I didn't stop fighting Donald Trump when he won. Um, I was out there on the night of the executive order on immigration at O'Hare protesting. Um, I've been a vocal opponent of his throughout, and I was the first gubernatorial candidate to call for his impeachment because he has, in fact, obstructed justice. So, um, yes, sir, and then I'll come back here. Hello, uh, David Daly. Um, this group, uh, the Internet, is very important to us. Um, I just want to ask you about uh, 
how are you planning to keep the internet open and accessible to the people of Illinois? We've got a fight. I think it was this gentleman back here, right, who gave the tutorial on net neutrality. So we've got a fight. I mean, you'll lead the way. Um, uh, but, you know, we'll, we, we've got to stand up for, 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 you know, against the companies that are trying essentially to close it. Um, uh, the second thing is that um, across the state of Illinois, we need high-speed internet. You know, we have it here and we take it for granted. But, um, but when you get outside of Cook County and into the Collar Counties and then into downstate Illinois, I mean, we have real opportunity if we bring broadband across. So it's an infrastructure project that I think will create jobs. But more important than the infrastructure building, which will create jobs, is the jobs that will get created because people will have access to the internet, both in terms of their ability to do research, to do development of product, and to actually start businesses. Um, we have a lot of areas like coal country in Illinois where, you know, new business uh, industries need to get started. Um, and, and I think having high-speed internet across the state will help do that. Um, finally, as you know, I've been a, you know, a, a strong advocate of the state being involved with helping to build the tech community. Um, it's not because I think government needs to be involved in everything. I don't. Um, but, you know, we, we created 1871 in part from a state grant. There were lots of private dollars, but there was a state grant involved. Um, many of the best developments that have occurred in Chicago for our tech community actually occurred because the state got involved. The Maybe you've heard of Chicago Ventures, a venture capital firm here in Chicago, was originally called the Illinois Innovation Accelerator Fund. Um, and I, with the head of the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, created that fund. Um, and it was vital that the state be involved in it in its first incarnation. 1871 is now free, you know, free of, of its uh, obligations under the grants that it received, and it's done way more than the state ever uh, uh, assumed that it would do. And uh, the I2A fund, which is now Chicago Ventures, is obviously an independent venture capital firm and really sparked a lot of the seed funding in the state. So just those are some other things that I would think about in terms of how the state can be involved in both the development of the tech community and in the, you know, in protecting and building on our ability to have high-speed internet uh, in Illinois. Um, there was somebody I pointed, yeah, back here. I'll just get him and I'll come back to the front. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, do you think Illinois should lobby for Chapter 9 bankruptcy protections to the U.S. Congress? Like, basically, do you think we should have the right to go bankrupt? I don't think that we need to go bankrupt. I don't think that we ought to be lobbying for the right to go bankrupt. I think that's something that the governor of Illinois today probably favors, although I haven't heard him say it. Um, he's uh, very tight-lipped about it, but there's no doubt that he has taken us to the brink of insolvency in this state. And he likes the idea, by the way, of the reason he doesn't want to budget, in my opinion, um, is because he wants to be able to rewrite the rules around our pension plan. You know, these are promises that were made to city, I mean, to state and uh, workers and to teachers across the state. Um, and the, it's a contract, everybody. Contract was made. You took a job as a teacher. You got n paid not a lot of money. Um, you, you knew you were going to get a pension. And now you're nearing a retirement age. And the governor is going to tell you, sorry, whatever you saved up for is not going to be enough. We're going to take away 40% of your pension. That's just not right. We, ha we can live up to the obligation. There is a financial uh, uh, method for living up to that obligation. And I've talked about it quite a lot. I won't bore you with the details of it. But we, we can meet our obligations. We don't need to do what the governor would have us do, uh, which, I, you know, which is driving us to insolvency. Gosh, um, I'll get this gentleman right here, and I'll come over here. Hi, um, I'm a public worker with Cook County and a proud member of SEIU Local 73. You mentioned uh, the Koch brothers' right to work attacks on this country. So I'm curious uh, for you, if you were to become governor and the Supreme Court overturns Abood and creates a public sector that is right to work, what would you do to protect public workers in Illinois and our, the organizations that we've formed? Well, I'm just, I, you know, I'm fundamentally opposed to right to work. Um, and so do every, essentially everything and anything in my power to make sure that we protect labor unions. Because ladies and gentlemen, 
you know, even if you don't belong to a labor union, and I bet not many people in this room do, labor unions are not only the backbone of the middle class in this state and in this country, but they also have created an opportunity for people to have higher wages who don't belong to unions. What you do to fight for higher wages and what the labor movement does to fight for higher wages benefits everybody. Um, most people don't pay for that you know, ability, that the, you know, what the unions go do for, for all of you and all of us and for our society, but that is what labor unions do. Um, so, uh, and I want to say proudly, since you raised the labor unions, um, that I'm the only candidate that's received the endorsement of any labor unions. I have 16 labor union endorsements individually and the endorsement of the statewide AFL-CIO. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Can I get somebody in the, in the yeah, this lady right here. I just want to make sure we have, because somebody said men talk too much. I think it was, a, <laughs> uh, so I want to make sure. Lady? This lady right here, sorry. Hi, I'm Carlene McAllister. Um, I was wondering, I think there was tonight a lot of agreement with a lot of things that you said, but this group isn't just about particular policies. A lot of people are really interested in the process of how we have good government, including open meetings, access to data. And so I wondered both while you're campaigning and then after you're governor, how is your strategy going to operate are, you know, in terms of being open about meetings, agreements, and support versus... Um, needing, say that again, need, needing open... Meeting, open oh, meetings, open meetings, who yeah. you're supported by, sure. what yeah. sort of agreements you have with people versus, yeah. you know, as a business, private business yeah. person, you don't have to do that. Yeah. So that's a big change. Good, th thank you. I, I, by the way, I've been transparent about everything I think about my campaign other than revealing my strategy for winning against my opponents, but, um, which I'm not going to share with you today. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, I have been very open. I mean, my endorsements, people who've endorsed me have been very public about that. Luis Gutierrez has endorsed me. Um, the city, you know, Kurt Summers, the treasurer of the city of Chicago has endorsed me. Um, I've got the, I mean, the list of endorsements, both from, from unions. I've been very public about that and all about the state reps and state senators, and there are dozens of those. So <clears throat> I think I've been very open about, you know, those kind of who's supporting me. Um, as well, you know, we've built a grassroots movement in our campaign. We've got, I and mean, we're online in every which way you can be and trying to gain people's support and get them involved in the campaign. One of the things that you may or may not like about my campaign and my candidacy is that I'm not raising money. And the reason that I chose not to do that was predominantly because Bruce Rauner, who people think self-funds, actually takes tens of millions of dollars from the Koch brothers. And I mean, he got his largest contributor, $20 million, Ken Griffin, the wealthiest man in Illinois. These are folks, and there's going to be much more, probably the U-Lines and probably lots of other, because they did this in, in 2016. And I want you to know that when I stand up in front of you and tell you that I'm for a progressive income tax, and that I'm going to fight for 15, and that I'm going to make sure we legalize marijuana, that I am, those are the things I really believe. And there's nobody who's going to call me in the middle of the night uh, who backed me, who wrote me a check or something, who's going to say to me, you can't do that thing you said you were going to do, because we won't back you in the next election. And you know that happens. What, what's that? I said you do a really good imitation. Of that guy who calls in the middle of the night? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, that's, that's, I, that's how I imagine politicians end up breaking their promises. Because they get calls from people who gave them a bunch of money. And, you know, and they say, not going to do it. Not going to do it next time unless you, you know, stop what you're... Let's give you this question. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, but I, I get your point. I mean, but I've been very public. I mean, I think everybody, I, you can read everybody that's supporting me. I've been very, you know, open about that. And, and I'm proud uh, of the support that I get. And there are people who don't support me. I think that's very public too, you know. And so, 
You know, but I am who I am. What I believe, I'm an independent thinker, an independent leader. I have stood for the, th- I've told you what I've been doing for, you know, decades. Um, and, and I'm not going to change. There's nobody who can tell me what to believe, what to support. I'm telling you what I believe and you'll be able to hold me to it because, because why else would I run, honestly? So, um, so I, I, seeing no other women raising their hands. Um, okay, one more. Do you mind just this one right back here? I'm sorry, just one more right here. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for being here. Um, this is a question regarding education. Um, as you know, you said the state funds education 26%, but a lot of that comes from the lottery, which in itself is regressive, and then the funds are redistributed, not back to the communities that primarily play the lottery, but instead to a common pool. Um, how do you plan on increasing education funding without adversely it more hurting regressive. people by being more aggressive with the lottery or yeah. by also giving back to the communities that are playing the lottery? So lottery doesn't provide a predominant amount of that 26%, but it's a, it's a piece of it. Um, and, and I don't disagree with you. The lottery is, is regressive by any measure. Um, but it's why I fight for a progressive income tax. It's why I think that we need to base it on income level um, and not have this flat tax. By the way, there are four states in the United States with a flat tax. Four states. Everybody else has done away with it. Um, it's antiquated. It's wrong. It's regressive. We need to get rid of it. And I, you know, in every which way that I can, that I think is is feasible, we should make taxes progressive. That's the right way to do it. We shouldn't be burdening. You know, this this uh, budget that got passed, not ideal. This budget. This is not a democratic budget, really. Um, Democrats voted for it, but it's because we had to have a budget, and they did a lot of compromising with Republicans in order to get the budget. But that budget raises the flat tax. So people who are making twenty and thirty and forty thousand dollars are paying the same rate as other people as we raise the. T- it's wrong. It's just the wrong way to go about things. So that that's what I would do about education. We have to raise education funding and do it, in my opinion, with a progressive income tax. Now we also need to be efficient about government. I mean, this isn't all just about raising taxes. We also have to lower. You know, there, there's a lot of efficiency that we can find in government. I'm hoping many of you will help do that, because I think there's innovation that can be brought to government that will help us lower the cost of the bureaucracy. Uh, but fundamentally, this is, you know, we've got a lot to do in this state, and a progressive income tax is going to help us get there. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry I took over and added another uh, uh, question, but thank, thank you all very much for the time. Yeah.